But under the surface, I would argue that this is a time of potentially major change. Especially over the coming four to five years, the most consequential component will be how effective each country is in its own domestic economic rebalancing. I really think that's the most fundamental driver out there as we look to, say, a five-year period or so. Uh, the broader positioning of each country in Asia is also shifting in ways that over a five-year period or so can be really quite significant. So we need very serious attention to this, more conscious attention to it than I think either side is giving at this point. Uh, I think on balance, a great deal is likely to contribute to growing strategic distrust, which is going to make everything else more difficult over the longer term. I think it therefore behooves both sides to think more clearly about two things. One, those actions that most strongly contribute to strategic distrust on the other side. What do we do that pushes their buttons and undermines their confidence in our long-term intentions? And secondly, what change, what can we do differently that would actually produce a significantly different assessment? Again, those are not easy issues but let me uh, conclude my formal remarks with them. Thank you very much. I'm happy, again, as I mentioned before, to take uh, questions on anything uh, with two conditions. One, every question has to have the word China in it, and every question ends in a question mark. Okay, uh, with that in mind, Connie? And, and also, by the way, please wait for, we have roving mics, so please, as Connie is, wait for the mic. You might say your name and then ask your Okay, I'm, I'm Connie Cook. Uh, I saw a fabulous cartoon in the China Daily last week that I wish I'd brought home with me. It had several frames contrasting Republican and Democratic positions on various issues, on the environment, on taxes on social issues, and then the last frame said the thing on which they agree is that they don't like China. Mm -hmm. Would you please contrast the Republican and Democratic Party views or leaders' views on China? Who are the Republican leaders? <laughs> uh, no, I meant, I mean, that's a serious question right now. They're debating every day. Um, I think what, is, what has generally been true in the past remains true at the core of each party, which is to say the Republicans are much more free trade oriented and uh, therefore in general have been uh, better from a Chinese perspective on, e on economic and trade issues. Democrats have tended to be more protectionist. Uh, Democrats also tend to focus on human rights more. Uh, so the Democrats, ironically, the, re the Chinese tend to like conservative Republican presidents because right? they, they kind of hard-nosed, let's just build the relationship type folks. Uh, and uh, so George W. Bush did very well in China. You know? I think, frankly, and I'm, I'm not being sarcastic, I'm being serious when I say this, they thought George W. Bush was the perfect president because he liked China. He uh, was prepared to be tough on Taiwan and keep his word to the Chinese on Taiwan. Uh, he followed through on what he said he would do in U.S.-China relations. And he weakened America in every other way. <laughs> so what's not to like from their perspective, right? The uh, uh, Democrats, they generally have trouble with uh, because they focus on human rights issues. You know, China becomes much more symbolic for Democrats. Uh, human rights issues, uh, trade, you're stealing our jobs, you're undermining our way of life, all that kind of thing. Uh, and Democrats somehow or other feel they have to show they are not weak on national security and therefore can actually, in a peculiar way, be tougher on China on, on the security side than the Republicans were. Uh, and I think those, those sentiments still run fairly strong strategically in each party. Uh, having said that, uh, let me make three other comments. One, always during presidential elections, the only exception since the Nixon visit in 1972 was 2008, the Obama-McCain race. With that sole exception, every presidential election has been characterized by negative rhetoric about China, where the party on the outs uh, has criticized the party on the in, you know, the incumbent party, on the basis they've been too soft on China. So whether it's Bill Clinton's butchers of Beijing or what, you name it, that's been the constant refrain. 
Secondly, every, new, every president, once they're in office for a short period of time, realizes that the previous incumbent to the office had pretty much the right set of policies on China and finds a face-saving way to move back to them and then build on them so that the campaigns don't anticipate the relationship over the long run, although they may create problems over the short run. That's what worries me about the Romney campaign, by the way. If he's elected, assuming he keeps on his current kind of track vis-a-vis -vis China, he's going to find this hard to climb out of some of the positions that he said he'll take. Like, on day one, I'll designate China as a currency manipulator. And uh, those will be, those will cause a lot of trouble in the first couple of years. I mean, it will really take quite a while to climb back to where we are on the day before he assumes office. Right? Uh, number three, for tactical reasons, I've just given you the strategic profile of each party. For tactical reasons, you can find them all over the lot. Right? So, um, these, in the Senate, the Senate passed a, a currency bill against China. That was overwhelmingly uh, with Democratic and Republican support. It was fully, you know, it, it was fully uh, bipartisan. Uh, that won't get through the House, I believe. The main reason it won't get through the House is because of conservative Republican opposition. Uh, the main reason conservative Republicans oppose it is because they see it as a revenue-raising bill because it would apply tariffs to Chinese imports, raise tariffs on Chinese imports. That would be the net effect. That would feed the beast. It would give the national government more money than it currently has. So on principle, they oppose it. It has nothing to do with China, right? So you can get tactical considerations that move folks in almost every which way, given the complexities of our government. But I think the, the long-term strategic positions remain pretty much what they've been in the past and what I tried to outline for you. With that answer, no one wants to ask another question, I think. Yeah. Yes, sir. Uh, there's a mic. Come here. Oh, I'm sorry. I meant it for you, but why don't we go here since the mic is here and then down to you, sir. Yes, sir. Dick DeLamelaire, attorney. Uh, what is the present status of uh, China honoring patent rights, trademark rights, copyrights? You know, China's... Uh, formal laws governing intellectual property are very good. Uh, they're an adherent to, I think, every major international convention on this. They made a number of efforts domestically to uh, give those laws teeth, especially in the major eastern metropolises like Beijing and Shanghai and Guangzhou. They have intellectual property rights courts. Uh, which are actually fairly qualified to deal with what are complicated and difficult issues. Having said that, their record is terrible. Uh, and it's terrible, I think, for two reasons. One reason is, as a matter of national strategy, the Chinese government, like every current industrialized country at some point in its development, other than England, everyone other than England, uh, has depended on theft of intellectual property to kickstart their economy, right? We did it from the Brits. You know, everyone has done it. England didn't do it only because they came first. There's no one to do it with, right? But, uh, but then you count, and this will get to the second reason why their record is lousy. You count on, over time, a natural evolution of where you begin to develop indigenous firms that have the capability to become innovative, to develop intellectual property and to want to protect it. They become more important players in their own system. And so the system moves, you know, the center of gravity moves toward increasing protection of intellectual property, right? And we've seen that in every country. No country becomes perfect, but moving from here to here is very significant for how that economy functions and your capacity to protect intellectual property. A big problem in China is this political economy that I talked about before. Because when you sue for intellectual property violation in China, you have to sue in the locality that produced the counterfeit product. Not where it was sold, but where it was produced. But in that locality, the counterfeit firm is often regarded by the local political leadership as downright upright. Right? 
generates taxes, generates employments, generates GDP growth. Firm based in Shanghai, Shanghai government may be going nuts because their firms are being undermined, but they have no reach out to someplace in Hunan, right? So there are areas of China where counterfeiting, where the array of intellectual property theft and, and, and utilization of that for profit is their core competence, okay? And fully protected by local leaders. And the system needs to evolve a lot before you can undermine that. Uh, and you would really have to change the incentives of local leaders. So they no longer engage, I, I didn't talk about this explicitly, but let me say, currently local leaders engage firms in their bailiwicks at a microeconomic level, firm by firm. Uh, many firms, both public and private sector in China, regard key competitive advantage is how close can I get to the government? Not like you normally assume in companies, you want to be as far from the government as you can. The competitive advantage isn't drawn close. Right? So this is a kind of nexus that really produces a lot of, uh, a lot of outcomes like protecting counterfeiters, because they're good for the local economy. And, the, and it's very hard to get at them. Even if you successfully sue them in a local court, the judgment almost certainly is not going to be one that's going to put those folks out of business. Right? So it remains a very difficult situation, and I think is going to be very difficult. There'll be some improvements, but fundamentally, it's going to be a real problem for a long time to come. Even as their own patent system has been exploding in terms of size and registered patents and all that kind of stuff, the fundamentals are uh, this is a major problem for foreign technology. Uh, now, sir, you, you had a question. If we have a mic down here, please. Uh, j just one moment, please. The mic is coming your way. Thank you. Yes, besides the conspirational theories containing the protocols of the wise men of Washington and Beijing, what is the actual feeling of the people making business on both sides of the ocean? Uh, I think, you know, there are uh, a lot of feelings because we're dealing with a lot of folks in different industries and different backgrounds and that kind of thing. I think uh, fundamentally, uh, you know, American corporations have been a mainstay of the U.S.-China relationship. I mean, politically, they have gone to bat for this relationship uh, repeatedly. Um, it's interesting, when you talk and even when you look at surveys that our chambers of commerce do in Beijing and Shanghai and Guangzhou, uh, sentiment is changing. Now, you have the ironic situation where business has never been better. They're making more money. Most of them are investing to grow their businesses. Um, you know, things are going very well. But they think the trend is in the wrong direction that increasingly regulations are being either written or enforced in discriminatory ways, that sentiment is moving against them as the Chinese try to promote their own national champions, their own local brands, and so forth. Uh, and so they're very worried about the future. And you see in Washington now, they aren't nearly as willing to go to bat as they were even two or three years ago. Uh, so that's a, you know, that's a significant shift in sentiment. Uh, Chinese businesses, I'm not as confident I have my finger on the pulse of them, they're doing a lot of things. Most Chinese businesses for a long time have been very happy to operate just in China because there's so much low-hanging fruit in China given a rapidly growing economy. Um, and many have been very happy to have foreign businesses there because they learn management and they get technology and there's capital injected and all that and they've been very good at learning you know, from those experiences. I think now Chinese companies, at least the better ones, are increasingly thinking about how you make money abroad. They began by investing mostly in natural resources, which are relatively, they're large, but relatively simple type investments. They then expanded into a whole array of commercial and manufacturing investments, but generally in countries right around China's periphery or in developing countries, especially in Africa. Right? They're now trying to move into Europe and North America. Europe, much faster than North America. And at this point, North America is still seeing, especially the United States, is still seeing as basically a hostile environment. So investment has been growing here, 
but everyone is aware of the huge embarrassments that, for example, the China National Offshore Oil Corporation suffered when it tried to acquire Unicom, uh, or that Huawei has suffered uh, in several things it's tried to do here. Um, and so, and the last thing in the world they want to do is be embarrassed publicly. So they need a lot of reassurance uh, and a lot of, frankly, guidance as to how you handle local governments and the media and, and uh, the fact that we're serious about environmental laws, and equal opportunity laws, and discrimination laws. And, you know, we have a very tough environment if you aren't used to this. It's going to take a while. Uh, so I think at this point they want to come. They're very nervous about coming. Some are in here, but it's a huge opportunity if we could do better on it. Uh, but both sides have a lot of work to do. I'll, I'll add one more comment about that. One thing that generates, in my experience, an unbelievable, no, I'm sorry, all too believable and justified level of outrage in China is our visa process, uh, where we insist that any visa applicant actually show up physically at a US embassy or consulate for an interview which will be scheduled at the convenience of the embassy, not infrequently after the time that they were supposed to have been in the United States. Uh, when they finally get the visa interview, it generally lasts a maximum of two minutes, uh, at which time they are told whether they've been granted the visa or not. These are arbitrary decisions. Pardon me? I didn't hear. They have to be fingerprinted. And they also have to be fingerprinted, yes, but that, that's also insulting. But fingerprinting, I don't mind, because that is a legitimate security kind of issue, although we have yet to identify our first terrorist from China, let me say. But, and most of these came in after 9-11. But, uh, but the rest of this process is obscene. Uh, and you would be astonished at the people who have been turned down. It would blow your mind. Vice ministers are turned down. Heads of the biggest research organizations in China are turned down. And it's arbitrary, absolutely arbitrary. And it is outrageous. Uh, and there is enormous anger over it. So, you know, my feeling is if Gary Locke, as the new ambassador, has one signature issue, it ought to be getting our visa system working in a reasonable fashion. Uh, and it would do a world of good for us. Yes, sir. Uh, what are your thoughts on the Dalai Lama's visit to the White House last year? It seemed like it was a delicate balance. The Obama administration was trying to strike. They delayed it. They had it. And they had him exit by what seemed like staged trash bags and barrels to seem to say it wasn't a serious visit. So there's two questions. Um, what were the policy thinker, thinkers on our side thinking about? And what's the end game from China's point of view? vis-a-vis uh, -vis, um, foreign relations and, and the Dalai Lama's role? Well, uh, first of all, from our point of view, uh, the, uh, the initial opportunity for, the, for His Holiness to visit the White House was in October of 2009. The President's state visit to China was in November of 2009. The President believes quite strongly, and I think rightly, that you don't want to do something that the other side will see will see as egregiously insulting right before you go for a state visit. I mean, it's just not smart. So the White House said in October that we are not inviting the Dalai Lama. When pressed, I mean, they didn't announce this, but you know, it got out. We're not inviting him now, but he will be welcome at a point in the future. The next time the Dalai Lama came, as I recall, was February of 2010. And at that point, he was invited to the White House. Uh, I think that was quite understandable. How he was treated at the White House was exactly the way he is always treated by every recent president. Uh, you, you do not meet the president in the Oval Office uh, you, or in the Roosevelt Room. You don't meet him in the West Wing. Uh, you meet him in the residence part of the White House, downstairs typically in a place called the Map Room. Very prestigious room. A lot of history has occurred there. But it's not official. It's considered the residence. Uh, and it's treated as an unofficial visit uh, of a spiritual leader for whom we have profound respect. And I think that's about the right treatment. Uh, the, um, how the Chinese deal with all this, I think about as badly as you can deal with it, frankly. Uh, what, you know, what the Chinese don't understand, when I say the Chinese, I mean you know, 
Chinese policy, okay? I mean, individual Chinese have different views, have a variety of views. But at a policy level, uh, they absolutely refuse to concede that the Dalai Lama is recognized by anyone as a spiritual leader. Right? To them, he is 100% a political figure who leads an exile government that challenges, de facto, the government that governs Tibet. In fact, won't even recognize the boundaries of the Tibet Autonomous Region as the boundaries of Tibet. Because, in fact, it divides up what are basically Tibetan areas on the High Tibetan Plateau. Uh, because they'll only treat him as a political figure, they're out of step with virtually everyone else in the world. You know, I've noticed when he's come to the University of Michigan, we've welcomed him here going back to the 1980s, as I recall, at various times. He draws an enormous crowd in Chrysler Arena when he has a spiritual session, when he talks about ethics and Buddhist teachings and that kind of thing. Thousands of people come, right? Citizens of the state of Michigan, most of whom are Buddhists. They aren't there because he leads an exile government. They're there because he's a revered man, you know, in the Buddhist tradition. He is, uh, you know, he is a lama and at the top of the hierarchy uh, of, uh, of the Tibetan Buddhist uh, tradition. So, you know, I think the Chinese get this very wrong. Clearly their strategy is to wait until he dies. His successor will obviously be a child, right? And they figure they then have the dominant hand. They will try to pick his successor. He is threatening to name his successor before he expires. I frankly don't know how you do that if the successor is supposed to be the reincarnation of, I mean, I just don't know how that works. But I, you know, he knows better than I do. I mean, you know, I don't, sorry, I don't know how that goes. But uh, I think China is in fact, has in fact set itself up for a much greater problem than it otherwise would have had. Uh, I've had the privilege of getting to know the Dalai Lama over the years. Not, not, close, but I've met him you know, a num quite a number of times. And uh, I really believe that he is absolutely serious, and has been absolutely serious, when he said what he wants is to preserve Tibetan culture, absolutely recognizes that politically Tibet is a part of China, uh, absolutely will affirm that economically in many ways what's happening in Tibet was necessary. But he fears the cultural and spiritual consequences of that, and he thinks he can play a significant role in it. Uh, and he also thinks that Tibetan culture can re reestablish its traditional role as a bridge between China and India, which it has really lost. Right? So I think that's his real view. They want to wait him out because they don't trust him. And the, uh, the bottom line of that is that while he's not a separatist, his successors very likely are. Younger Tibetan movement, I am told, is deeply angry at how he's handled all of this, uh, and much more radical than he is. Uh, so I think the Chinese are actually missing their best opportunity to uh, reconcile things in Tibet in a way that's viable going forward. They're creating a massive problem. And we see now there are young nuns who are you know, committing self-immolation. How long can that go on without something clicking somehow, yeah, I mean, without a level of, of questioning a basic policy. Yeah. So, Ken, we're, let's you know, not exhaust Ken, so let's have this be the last question. Of, uh, okay, the and over here, please. Yeah. Here, uh, there's a microphone coming right to you. Wow. Um, well, first of all, thank you for your presentation. My name's Rachel Goodstein. I'm an alum of the China Center, 1974. <laughs> Um, my question goes back to the U.S. politics, and in your opinion, would the Chinese like to see President Obama reelected? I'm sorry, would the Chinese government like to see President Obama reelected? Re I think what they have found generally is that once a president has been in office for four years, uh, they know him pretty well, and they always prefer what they know to what they don't. And so I think the answer would be they'd be quite comfortable with his continuing in office because it's an ongoing thing. And we are now working very hard on getting, you know, the, the designated, I mean, the almost certain person who will take over from Hu Jintao is Xi Jinping. And uh, he hosted Vice President Biden uh, in August. 
who will be coming to the U.S. probably in January. Uh, will have very extensive exposure, not only to the vice president, but the president and top cabinet officials and so forth. So we're building in, beginning to gain the familiarity with the successors coming in, and I think that's something that they feel uh, more comfortable with. After all, we are not, he isn't getting together with Vice President Biden because Vice President Biden will become president, right? But we are doing it because he will become president and head of the party. So I think that that's, uh, you know, their comfort level is a little higher with that, but they'll work with whoever comes in because that's what you do. Okay, thank you very much. <laughs>